probably aware that we had uh, developed a cargo strategy back in 2017 and clearly that's needed some updating over the course of the last few years, not least because of the impact of the, of the pandemic. We've got four pillars within that strategy. Um, we talk about digitalization a lot, we talk about engagement with our cargo community and I think we'll come on to talk about uh, that in a little moment. But the other two pillars are really relevant to the question that you've just asked. So we have a a, a pillar really focused in on the efficiency with which government can help our operation all around policy change. And we have a, a pillar all focused in on the transformation of our, of our cargo estate. So maybe if I touch on policy first and then talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure challenges or opportunities that, we, that we've got. We are here in Miami at the Air Cargo Forum by Tiaka. And with me today for the conversation is uh, James Holding. Uh, he is the head of cargo at uh, London's Heathrow Airport. James, uh, very happy to have you join us for this conversation. Thanks, Rajiv. Great to be here. James, let's start with your uh, some of the numbers that has already come out. 2019, it was 1.6 million tons. In 2021, I'm not even looking at 2020 numbers. 2020, yep. 2021, it was 1.4 million. How does it look like 2022 as of now? It's still a testing time. I think we're still recovering. Like you said, 2019 was a good year for us. It wasn't the strongest that we'd ever had. Uh, 2017, 2018, we were hitting 1.8 million. It's a little bit north of the 1.7 that we did in 2019. Clearly, you know, you lost over 2020 there. I think, yeah, best left unsaid, uh, the challenges that we had in, in, in that year. Last year, we really saw the build back of belly capacity at Heathrow, which, as you know, is, is fundamental to, to making sure those tonnage figures are, are really high. We're still seeing pretty comparative levels to, to 2021, I should say, um, at this point. We did have a forecast in place for sort of 1. Uh, 1.6 million for this year. I think we'll be a little shy of that. I think obviously we've had some events that we couldn't have predicted. The continued lockdowns in China haven't helped us, um, particularly over the Easter period. Obviously, we've had Russia's uh, invasion of, of Ukraine, um, which has disrupted flights to the Far East. Um, and of course, the Russian market as well, which was, was pretty key for us. I think we'll be a little bit more pessimistic than perhaps we would have been at the start of this year, but uh, still improving. There's still growth in the, in, in the market and uh, we're excited where 2023 will take us. You still have the, the peak season, the last quarter of the year. We Probably do. you can st still uh, touch the 1.6 million. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we're, we're seeing a little bit slower growth this Christmas than we did last, last Christmas. I think that's partly because the belly capacity has been much more consistent this year than it was last year, certainly in the second, the second half of this year. But Christmas is always an interesting one for us. Um, it relies on those additional frequencies that tend to come in over the Christmas period. And as you've been aware, we've, we've had a, a cap at Heathrow, um, a movement cap, which ended with the summer season. So that ended at the end of last month in October. We've just announced that there won't be um, a cap uh, over the, uh, the winter period, which we're incredibly pleased about. Certainly from a passenger perspective, we want to give confidence to, to the passengers who are traveling. And that will be helpful for cargo as well, um, because it will mean that the cargo can fly. We're still retaining an element of cautiousness over the Christmas period, just because there's still a little bit of volatility in the market. Clearly, things at the minute from an energy point of view, um, from a cost of living point of view, are keeping things slightly suppressed, I think, compared to where we were this time last year, which might mean we might not hit the 1.6 quite um, but but you know we'll take any improvements over previous years. James one of the challenges for you is the labor issues and the strike and that's been a, a point of pain for uh, London's Heathrow uh, mm. cargo department. Uh, what is the plan that you have how do you deal with it because uh, you would really want the evacuation of the cargo as quickly as possible. Sure. We're blessed with, with a, a large cross-section of handlers, cargo handlers at, at Heathrow. We have 11 uh, handlers, probably the most of, of any major airport. That can be both a blessing and a curse sometimes, I'll be honest. Um, but we have excellent relationships with all 11 of those, um, those handlers. The strikes that you refer to are two, two, two handlers in particular, so Menzies and Dinata, um, both, both made public. They're members who are represented by Unite, so their intention to strike uh, in, in the coming days. We are supporting them as much as we can with contingency planning. Ultimately, that is the responsibility of, of Dinata and Menzies in this particular instance. We will do all we can to support them um, to, to make sure that there is continuity for, for our airline's cargo operations. Also, critically, you know, we need to make sure that cargo and passenger are, are talking to one another. When a, when a handler does have uh, resourcing challenges, whether that's strike related or pandemic related, as we've seen in recent months, we need to make sure that there's that continuity of operation. I would never be in a position where I would uh, make sure that we're you know, fully resourced up on, on cargo and then letting the passenger side down. We need to find that balance across the, across the operation, particularly for a hub airport like Heathrow. Really important that we give confidence to passengers, particularly moving into the, to the Christmas peak. I'm sure that this is, a, this is a kind of ongoing conversation with your handlers who are probably not happy with probably what uh, things are. Is there any, any long-term plan how you can actually reduce instances of such happenings? I, th I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult one for us as the, as the airport to, 
to control. We have no no direct control over um, over the way in which our handlers engage with with, um, with with their workforce. It's a very difficult labour market for us all, and I think you know there's there's no there's no finger pointing between companies at Heathrow. We've had our own challenges from a resource perspective. We're now resourced up to 2019 levels um, of our security colleagues, as an example. But we know that there are continuing resource challenges across the sector. We I think we have a role to play in collaborating with with those companies to to, to really sell the benefits of of working in the the aviation industry. And then, obviously, more specifically from our context in the in the cargo sector, only by talking about the opportunities that the sector has will we make sure that we have the right resource levels and uh, are attracting the, the talent that, that we need in the industry. Let's talk about uh, investment into physical infrastructure and also in terms of changes of the the existing policies and new policies to deal with. Uh, the challenges of the air freight industry and the global trade and commerce and also to make Heathrow as competitive as possible within the UK and also as uh, as an important cargo airport within Europe. What are some of the plans? Um, fa fantastic question and you'll be aware that we had uh, developed a cargo strategy back in 2017 and clearly that's needed some updating over the course of the last few years not least because of the impact of the, of the pandemic. We've got four pillars within that strategy. Um, we talk about digitalization a lot, we talk about engagement with our cargo community and I think we'll come on to talk about uh, that in a little moment. But the other two pillars are really relevant to the question that you've just asked. So we have a, a, a pillar really focused in on the efficiency with which government can help our operation all around policy change. And we have a, a pillar all focused in on transformation of our of our cargo estate. So maybe if I touch on policy first and then talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure challenges or opportunities that, we, that we've got. The, from, from a policy perspective, um, we are doing a lot of work with government in the UK to understand how can we operate more efficiently within regulation. So if I can give you an example, we're not currently able to do airside connecting cargo at Heathrow. So we have a policy known as canalisation, which is a, an HMRC operating procedure that dates from you know, 20, 30 years ago when all of the airlines were handled effectively them, themselves. There, there, there was not the concept of, of an airline handler. Um, and what that means is it, it, all cargo has to go back to the shed um, of, the, of the handler servicing that aircraft. You cannot do a tail-to-tail -tail transfer, for instance. Hugely inefficient, um, as, as you would expect. Um, we believe that that drives around 500 landside vehicle movements every day that are completely unnecessary. Um, and by landside, I mean crossing that airside landside boundary. So going back to the landside environment, back into the airport environment again through that security control post. But actually, from an aviation security perspective, it's probably not the best idea. So we're working very closely with Border Force, um, with, uh, with HMRC and with other relevant government bodies in the UK to, to try and understand how can we retain really high levels of border security, which obviously we would never want to compromise. But whilst we're starting to improve some of those, um, that's what, what we would call legacy procedures, um, which we believe quite, uh, are quite limiting from an efficiency um, point of view. So, so that's sort of an example of how we're working with government to, to, to unpick those efficiency opportunities. What's the kind of timeline that you're looking at? Is it something that you, probably you don't have a control on, that it's a, it's a policy decision? It is, it, it is. And you know, we, we've talked a lot at this conference around the ability of airports to conduct the orchestra. We've heard that terminology being used quite a lot. An element of my orchestra is the UK government. And as we all know, governments and regulators tend to move at a slightly slower pace than the rest of the industry. Um, they have their reasons for doing that. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be mindful of that. So we're, we're, we're expecting a decision within the next few months. Um, I would like to think by the end of quarter one, if we were having a conversation again in four or five months time, I was able to say that, yes, we're able to, to at least trial connecting cargo at Heathrow. But, uh, you know, we, we, we remain in conversation and we, we, we very much hope that... Uh, the government continues to engage in the way that they have done, um, which has been hugely positive. Um, and I have to thank colleagues in government and cabinet office um, for, for their engagement today. Yeah, that's that's going to be bringing a lot of efficiency and speed to the evacuation of cargo. And I think that probably would uh, would see a lot more cargo throughput on LHR. Also on the on the physical infrastructure, what's the kind of investment that is you're planning for maybe the mid to long term? Heathrow, as is known to, to, to much of your audience, um, has a real... Uh, cross-section diversity of different infrastructure. So you've got some infrastructure which was built in the last two to five years. Um, fantastic quality buildings, definitely fit for, for the 21st century. And we have some older infrastructure, as you'll be aware. And it's that older infrastructure that naturally we're focused in on to understand how can we redevelop, how can we make some improvements, 
not just from an efficiency point of view, but also from a safety, security, and crucially, sustainability uh, perspective as well. The, the Heathrow environment, as is common in many airports, um, is one of a relationship with third parties. So um, we have a number of property companies who own uh, the vast majority of our, of our cargo estate at Heathrow. And we have a very good relationship with those companies to work with them on their plans for, for transformation of the, the estate. Going back to that sort of conducting the orchestra narrative, we, I think we as an airport have a real role to play in setting the the parameters within which those those companies can potentially redevelop. So we can align around things like our sustainability strategy. We can make sure that whatever we're doing, we, we have automation and innovation um, at its heart. Because in the nicest possible way, a, a property company will typically put up a shed. It's a lovely shed. It's very shiny and it's lo- you know, great to work in. But actually, if we really want to drive the industry on, we need to be thinking about sustainability and crucially automation and innovation. Um, what goes into those buildings is absolutely crucial to reduce cargo throughput times and make sure that we've got a really competitive proposition. What's your reading of the current uh, air cargo market condition? Do you expect the demand to be stable for the rest of the year and do microeconomic conditions impact consumer demand, consumer spending, and that would have an impact on air freight industry? Absolutely. I mean, the macroeconomic environment at the minute is is volatile, to say the least. In a very specific UK context, I think we've had a little bit more volatility than perhaps some of our European neighbours, um, and we've had to work work our way through that. So no doubt there are, there are headwinds for, for the air cargo industry, both in the UK, in Europe, and, and globally as well. I think the, the, the longer term uh, thread the longer term narrative will be one of sustainability and we've heard it mentioned here a lot uh, over the course of the last few days uh, here in Miami we need to find a path through to deliver sustainability in a way which is practical achievable um, and, and also really timely as well and, and at Heathrow we've just refreshed our Heathrow 2.0 plan which is our sustainability strategy we have uh, a number of different themes um, with which we've really tried to focus in on some shorter term targets so I mentioned the timeliness of delivering these improvements you'll be familiar with the sort of 2050 goals that the industry has set at Heathrow as in many other airports actually we've taken a step back and said well actually by 2030 we want to deliver some tangible improvements so we have a real focus on cutting carbon in the air by 15 percent compared to 29 19 levels. Sustainable aviation fuel absolutely at the heart of, of that strategy. Cutting carbon on the ground, 45% is our target, and that's where we have a greater element of control as an airport. Clearly, it's the airline that will have most of the ability to cut the carbon in the air. And then we have a, a, a big narrative around being a great place to live and work. Um, so we're really mindful that the impact that we have on our local communities um, and on our employees and on our companies, our third parties' employees at, at, at Heathrow, is significant. So we really need to be focused in on not just the what I would call the traditional elements of, of sustainability, but but that broader sort of diversification of the sector. So I know the question was around headwinds. I think you know there are shorter term macroeconomic conditions that the industry has to face into and and we will do because we're naturally quite resilient the the last two to three years has definitely shown that but i think longer term headwind sustainability is a is a headwind that probably will never go away and we need to embrace it and, and adapt to it james let's talk about the airport cargo communities airport becomes an anchor and then able to hold all the stakeholders together it's been seems to be working at different airports that we have seen it and i i also see that you you've been making visits to some of the important uh, airports within the us uh, where this has been tested and has been functioning quite well what is your assessment of uh, airport cargo communities do you think that's something that you would follow in uh, london Air cargo communities are, have been very, very successful. Um, you know, our closest comparator airports would be Brussels and, and Frankfurt, who both have very strong uh, cargo communities. They've adopted the, the approach of having a separate organization that is backed by the, the airport authorities and have, and have had great success, as I said, doing that. We don't have that currently at Heathrow, as you alluded to. But what we do have is a really strong cargo community. We don't have an official cargo community company. But you don't, my, my belief is you don't need a separate organization to deliver many of the same benefits and, and, and the results. So we have just established the, the Cargo Community Forum at Heathrow. Um, so we held our first session last month in October. A group of 50 or so um, senior representatives from all of the key companies uh, involved at Heathrow um, from a cargo perspective. So representatives from ourselves, clearly, as an airport, but our airlines, um, our handlers, our forwarders, and some of our uh, government uh, colleagues as well. So Border Force. Um, 
and colleagues representing our uh, our animal reception centre, for instance. So that's a very small way in which we can give a voice to, to everyone in the community and start to really listen and understand some of their concerns. I think the question was more around, you know, would we move to that more formalised approach? Um, I think we're definitely open to it. I, I can't say at this stage whether that's something that we'll be setting up in a, you know, a year, two years time. But certainly through our conversations with comparator airports uh, around the world, you alluded to, to some of the visits that we've done um, uh, whilst we're here in, in the States. We are learning a great deal and there is a great amount of um, desire for collaboration. And that's with airports that might traditionally be our competitors as well as uh, some of those that are not so um, we were visiting our colleagues at Dallas Airport um, earlier this week. Um, clearly not a not a direct competitor given market differences. But we also have a really strong relationship with the likes of Frankfurt and, and Brussels, who we deem more to be comparators than competitors. Um, we we think that there is a, a great amount of opportunity here to uh, to collaborate on key topics and make sure that ultimately the end to end cargo proposition is really strong for the shipper, the forwarder, and all of the actors then uh, at the airport. James, uh, what did you learn here in uh, Air Cargo Forum Miami, or what are you learning from, from here, and uh, what are you taking back to your team? Well, uh, firstly, great to be, to be back at these events in person. I think one of the things that Tiaka does incredibly well is bring together all of the actors in the, in the supply chain. We, we've mentioned that a, a, a few times in the course of the interview. Tiaka is, is very focused in on... Um, uh, on giving the airports a, an equal voice and for us clearly that's absolutely critical I, I i guess two two key things are probably coming out of the event for me sustainability as, as as we've touched on i think is at the heart of everything that we're doing now there is still not in 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 my view enough diversification in the in the industry uh, and i mean that from a from a people basis we need to see greater representation across all all elements of diversity in in our sector and we will not be truly sustainable until we are a diverse industry and I think we, we've we've had some really good discussions around that today. And there's a there's a panel later today actually around um, the role of women in in air cargo, which is significant already, but needs to be much more significant um, as one small example of of diversity. A second theme would be around collaboration, and, and clearly, I think you probably would expect me to say that collaboration is absolutely key. The the role of the airport in enabling a lot of that collaboration, I think, is often underestimated. Um, and certainly at Heathrow, we're we're really key uh, keen to be uh, a collaborator not just a, at a local context, but at that international level as well. James, uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Reggie.